memories in that cell block Who ain't never coming home And I got dead ones in that graveyard Cause the devil let them roam Yeah, we gang bang on the west coast This fully switch on these flame poles We pin poles and we fly past Hey, what's going on with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed, and you already know it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right, so let's get it done. With that being said, uh, an individual asked me about uh, what was my first removal in prison and removals that I regret. The removals that I'm going to talk about personally, I want the first one, I, I wasn't really involved in it, but I'll explain. The second one is the one I was involved in. The ones that I use for weapons, I really can't say because, you know, the statutes of limitations, they vary. So I could be picked up on charges, but they will be published in the book and outlined in a certain fashion to where it's not so incriminating to bring up a case against me anymore. But with that being said, let's get into the story, man. Like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment, and I would appreciate it. The first removal, when I was in county jail, we did a lot of removals. A lot. And a lot of them had consisted of bond number four being violated. And I could talk about those all day in my book and through other YouTube series. But an actual removal with weapons was when I went to Sad F C Yard. I was in building five. Now, the situation is this. Remember, I told you guys I was pulled on the streets, but I was barely gaining my education and undergoing a lot of the training process to become you know, well equipped for my management. When I was inside FC Yard, a lot of Norteños showed up from High Desert because they got into a riot with the Blacks. And honestly, when they got there, the hermanos took over the COC. There was uh, the homie Angel Dust from Catela, from Cutler, the homie Pit Bull from Gilroy, and then Boxer from Sacramento. And there was maybe about two others, but they pretty much were, they were new recruits, so. They had lower CLC positions, and then once I got there and I, I completed my NA process, you know, I fell in line with everybody else and started taking my orders and started, and started receiving more of my training. And I was receiving a lot more of my training through Angel Dust from Catela. You know, we were real close friends. But something in particular happened that really opened my eyes to, to understanding that the struggle that I was being a part of, the organization that I got involved in, was real deep because I hadn't seen such severity in county jail or in North Kern Reception Center. This one was different. You know, remind you, I did a couple removals in the reception center on a new flower and in county jail, we got rid of uh, Gerald Cuete Rubacabla's younger brother, Eddie, you know, for the, some of the stuff he'd done. So I got to see you know, some certain things take place that, you know, that it gets deep. You know, there's a, there's a heavy involved dynamic that that gets put in place. So the, an, an individual named Green Eyes shows up. He's from San Jose. As soon as he gets there, we put him through the, the NA process, the new arrival process and the screening. But remember, like I told you, when you have status, it's a different NA clearance. So there's different procedures, different questions, different investigations that we have to take. There's a different approach to that kind of clearance process as opposed to being regular Northerners. But in, once he submitted his bundle and who his uh, padrino was, who, who his C was, who he answers to, his contacts, he automatically felt like once we read it, we were supposed to clear him. And we told him like, no, we need to verify everything that you said. And his particular situation was delicate because Carnal that actually pulled him was Dancing Bear from San Jose. And Dancing Bear was in county jail right now fighting another murder case for writing a letter and saying, yeah, go ahead and do it. Those were the exact words in that letter. And they got Dancing Bear for conspiracy to commit murder. While Dancing Bear was in county, he was pulling a lot of individuals, gaining them status, sending them to prisons with the direct orders that any prison that you go to, the due to the fact that he was considered a Cat 3 high-ranking member, that he, they are to tell the authorities in charge to relinquish their positions and give them to these particular soldiers that he wanted working for him. Not knowing that Dancing Bear was already on freeze by the Familianos. So this individual kept walking around saying, you guys shouldn't be putting SBs on me. You guys are treating the fellow at mono wrong. You know, you guys need to recognize my status and recognize the C that pulled me, that he's a cat three. You can't undermine his authority. You can't undermine his orders. You guys need to clear me. 
And he was in my section, so I used to always tell him, like, bro, you need to fall in line like the rest, bro. Like, you're not going to come over here abusing your authority and throwing your status around. I don't really care who the carnal is. At the time, I wasn't educated on the historia, so I didn't know nothing about Dancing Bear other than he was just a, a C. We already had information that he was on freeze anyway, so we really can't acknowledge the C status until further notice. So we were reaching to the back. Angel was reaching to the back to Corcoran Shu to find out more about this particular individual situation as well as Green Eyes. So Green Eyes started conducting himself not in a high fashion and not upholding the status of a Norteño, how Norteños should conduct themselves. He was acting real arrogant and he was basically threatening us, telling us, hey man, once 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 I get cleared, bro, and I run this by Dancing Bear, all you guys are gonna get stripped for your status for not respecting my status and relinquishing the authority. First of all, I wasn't even authority in charge. I was in a lower COC, so I didn't really have too much input or anything to do with what's taking place with the high command. I didn't. I was just, they were just keeping me abreast of everything that was going on, what was taking place, but that was it. It was just from my own knowledge and my own personal notes. Because as a Norteño, any facility you go to, you have to draft up notes. You have to have your own personal bundle of everything that took place. All removals, all sanctions, implementations, orders from the back, you're going to have a personal bond of every note that you've been through so that way you can submit it to be pulled as a carna. They need to know an actual timeline of all the sacrifices you've done, all the responsibilities that you've held, all the removals that you decided to make so they can investigate them and see if they were properly conducted, what charges, that way they can circulate these names for approval to be placed on the BNL, the NGNs, or the dropout list. So I was taking notes of everything. I had my own personal notes. This individual decided not to correct his conduct and he paid the price for it because one day he got drunk on a tear while he was still in a status and which is forbidden. When you're when you're a new arrival status and you're still in the process of being cleared, you don't smoke weed, you don't drink, you pretty much you're not even in good standings yet until you are labeled good standing. So your, your con conduct needs to be flawless. And he thought he could do whatever he want because he had status and because Dancing Bear was his padrino. That's not the case. You're going to fall in line like everybody else. You're going to follow the rules like everybody else. And he chose not to. Now, so when he gets drunk, they open up the slots for dinner to pass out the trays. And he told the Sudeño to stick his hand out the, the slot. The Sudeño did, thinking that he was going to give him something. And he started horse playing with him on a tear with his hand. And the Sudeño didn't look... look the Sudeño took it wrong because he felt like, man, you're you're drunk. I don't play with you like that. We don't we don't ever play with each other like that. So he wound up reporting it to the homie Pitt. And he tells Pitt, hey, bro, you're, what's up with your homie, bro? He's, he's not conducting himself in a proper fashion. He's talking on the vent loud. You know, he's disrespecting our program. He's interrupting our program. And now he just horse played with me. So the boxer at the time that did the removal was the porter. He went up to him. He's like, hey, Carna, you need to calm down. You need to stop what you're doing. First of all, you're not even supposed to be drinking. He denied it. He said, I'm not even drinking, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. Then the cops walked by and started passing out the trays and smelt the alcohol, confronted him about it, and he also denied it. And the cop goes, man, you're acting like a belligerent drunk right now. You can't tell me that you're not drinking. You need to calm it down. You're putting me on front street. And that's what cops on the main line hate the most is when you put them on front street. They don't mind that you do what you do. We're all going to do what we do. But if you put yourself on front street and you embarrass them, of course, they have to do their job. So after Trey pick up and they got the carts out, the cops came and they opened up the cell and they put him and his celly, they put him in, a, in the shower on the top tier and locked the door. And then they went in there and searched and found that there was still a batch left of Pruno. They took his celly to the bottom shower and they went and told Boxer, tell me who you need me to release out here. That way you guys can talk to him and put your homie in check. Now I'm in my cell observing all this from the bottom tier and my celly was also hermano at that time too. He was a fellow in Seoul. So we're just sitting here telling ourselves like, man, he's gonna get himself in a wreck that he's not gonna be able to get himself out of. But my celly was also using this as a learning example to teach me like, man, don't conduct yourself in this fashion. You know, just because you have status don't mean nothing. It can be taken from you that easy. You need to humble yourself. Don't make the same mistakes as this man. Always just go to a different branch of union, fall in line, get cleared. Then you take your orders from there. Don't be arrogant like this individual. It doesn't matter what car not pull you. That status doesn't really belong out here. The end soul status is different. So they actually pull out the homie Pitt and the homie Angel. And they actually go up to 
Green eyes on a top tier nigga, man. What's up, Carlan? Why you drinking? You know better than to be drinking while you're on NA status. You haven't even been cleared yet. And you're conducting yourself insubordinately that you're disrespecting other group segments. And he was like, man, y'all don't know what y'all talking about, man. You guys are going to pay for this, man. I can't wait till Dancy Bear hears what you guys have been doing, how you guys have been treating me. You guys are all going to pay for this. So Pitt already had went to the cell and found a cup of Pruno and walked up to the, the shower door and said, and pointed it to me. He goes, so you say you're not drinking? And Green Eyes arrogantly reached through the cage, grabbed the drink, drank it. And he goes, so what? For what are you going to do? You know, you can't do nothing to me. I'm going to end so. You know, Dancy Bear is going to hear about this. The homies finally got fed up and made the decision to remove him. I watched Boxer, I watched Boxer the Porter go to his cell for a little bit. And he was settled up with the homie Tycoon from Santa Rosa. They came out. Boxer came back with uh, another individual who was seeking status that was already doing life, which was a, a homie named Bad Boy from Sacramento. But that wasn't his real name. That was his tier name. And they told the cop, everything's okay. You can go ahead and pop the, pop the shower door. We're going to walk him back to his cell. He's going to calm down. So the tower cop popped the door and then he left, probably to attend some other section. And they started booking him, both of them with two flats. And by the time that went, when the cop came back and seen that this fool was pretty much half dead on the tier, just laying there, Boxer and Bad Boy got rid of the weapons. They left, we went to another section. The cop pressed the alarm and they came and escorted Green Eyes out. Those two individuals wound up getting 15 years attached to their sentences and Green Eyes was paralyzed from his waist down because I heard about him coming from other inmates that were on like medical facilities saying that Green Eyes was there. He's in a wheelchair. He needs medical assistance all the time. You know, he has a, a dookie bag and all that. And uh, he's pretty much just does his own program now. Only to come to find out later, Dancy Bear was deemed no good. So Dancy Bear got a lot of people on the reg. There was two other instances that when I went to different facilities, the individuals were coming saying they had status per Dancing Bear and automatically they were being stripped of their status saying it was invalid. And that was hurting a lot of people's feelings because they felt like, man, they didn't know, they don't know what goes on with the Familianos and what that takes place, the investigations, and the freeze process. We just know when we get these orders on these particular individuals, we abide by them. So a lot of, he, that Dancing Bear got a lot of people on a wreck. And this was that one circumstance that did. He actually gave status to an individual who didn't know how to use it properly. He thought that he had everything coming because of his status, in which that's never the case. Just because we had status, that was a responsibility to take care of the people. It was not a responsibility to abuse or use and weaponize. But a lot of individuals did. So with that being said, the other story, that is, this is a personal removal that took place with me. I had a homeboy on the streets from VCP named Bam Bam. I used to take him around my family when I was functioning with VCP at the time, when the regiment was real strong out there. He was a close friend. An incident happened at a high school where we got into it with some rivals. And I did what I had to do. So when I finally ran, we were running through some houses and Bam Bam's a big boy. He's like three, 400, he was like 300 pounds, a little stocky bro. And I got hit in the leg to where I couldn't, I couldn't run all the way. So I was kind of limping and there was no way I could jump through this fence. So I felt like I was barricaded. Well, Bam Bam ran through the fence and broke like three boards down. And he, when he, as he did so, the nails and the boards actually, actually pierced both his legs. So now both of us couldn't walk, but thankfully certain individuals had seen it when it took place and they were just right around the corner. So they were looking for us and they gave us a ride and we went back to our house. So Bam Bam always said, man, I saved your life, man. I saved your life and I paid the price for it too. Look at my legs. He had to go, he had to, go to the hospital because there were, there were rusty nails and that they, he couldn't stop the bleeding. Years go by and I hear about Bam Bam catching a case with a homegirl. Bam Bam is an old Corcoran. When the end got dropped, he, he dis, uh, all old Corcoran disagreed with what Snoop's policy was. So they weren't abiding by it. They said they were going to continue to live through the old traditions, the old ways. But Bam Bam caught a battery there and showed up to Tehachapi when I was there. So obviously, this is a, a childhood friend, a friend that I held dear to my heart from the streets. You know, that's it was rare that I met people from the streets that I actually kicked it with. So you now I went to go out there and reach out to him and, and, and guide him in the right direction and teach him the new laws. Even though he, back then I wasn't fond of him, I wasn't fond of the changes. But still, I, you know, I took it to heart that, you know, maybe if it's for the best interest, let's try these practices out. But Bam Bam wasn't having it. 
And Bam Bam was telling the committee and the rest of the members, like, nah, bro, this is stupid, man. Why does this man get to decide our fate? Why does this man get to decide, you know, what we can and can't say, what we can and can't do? Like, it wasn't like that before for the last eight years. He goes, why the sudden change? I disagree with him. He was just sharing his opinion. A lot of these individuals that were on the yard with Snoop, when I was on the yard with Snoop temporarily, you got to remember, once certain riders are around Snoop for so long, they start to act like him. They start to conduct themselves like him. Their attitude becomes like him. So that's a hard thing to argue with because they think they're always right because Snoop said it. So you can never change other people's minds. Actually argue out difference of opinions because they're so like, well, Snoop said it, so we're going we're gonna to go by it. And that's what's been destroying us for a long time. That's why we fight with each other so much because you have individuals who are willing to think for themselves, actually want to bring ideas to the table, actually want to voice their opinion, have some type of input, or maybe just get some type of agreement and compromise. But these particular individuals who are on a yard with Snoop act like Snoop. We call it the injection. So they start saying, no, no, we're not doing it per Snoop, per law. They start arguing loud and start acting just like rebellious towards anything that's against Snoop's orders. So Bam Bam wasn't having it, so Bam Bam started dissing himself from him. But Bam Bam was in my building, and he started always writing me like, nah, bro, I think we should get off on these homies, bro, and just leave. And I was like, hell no, nah, you're not going to just go victimize another homie just because you disagree. I go, if you want, if, if that's, if you're truly passionate about that, you can actually try to persuade the homies. You know, that's, that's your voice. You're allowed to go to these committees and speak on your behalf, on how you feel. Don't let them restrain you from that because of Snoop. I go, yeah, a lot of us didn't disagree with the, a lot of these new changes and these revisions that happened in 2014. Trust me, I don't. I go, but I still follow the law. You know, I still believe in the meaning of this movement aside from what this man's doing. But the straw that broke the camel's back was he was becoming violent with other porters, with other inmates. He started socking up a lot of his cellies because he wanted single cell status. That's a no-no. That's a no-no. And because he was in my building and at the time... I had a lot of influence on that yard, very influential, and I was putting in a lot of work. I had no choice but to make an executive decision without asking the committee permission or getting a vote. Do I leave this fool to here to do that or should I drop him? Because, you know, you can't just be beating up your cellies because you don't want to sell you. That's, that's wrong. That was unnecessary. And we're not bullies, even though oftentimes through our movement, and I can illustrate them, We've actually developed bully tactics. Even Snoop has developed bully tactics. Like we were losing sight of who we were. And the, la and the last thing that he did is he said, uh, he asked the porter for some disinfectant and he gave him a bottle, a shampoo bottle. But he threw out three more bottles and he said, I need three more. And the porter says, hey, I got to distribute it out equally to every other cell. Every cell needs some disinfectant. And he's like, bro, if you don't fill my bottles up, when I come out to use the phone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take flight on you. The porter came and talked to me. He's like, what's up with your bro, bro? Like, I don't want no problems with you guys, bro. I don't want to get involved in this. But he threatened me for this, this, and that. So I sat there, and it was Capone was right there from um, from Vallejo, Marcelli, Ruthless, my, and myself. We were the only three in that building, and they wrote me like, hey, bro, what you want to do, man? Look how he's acting, bro. Like, we got to take care of this, or else he's going he's gonna to get us into a wreck, bro. We're going to have to fight some bigger battles. So I wrote the homies back. I said, hey, bro, when we go to yard right now, we're just going to knock them down. Plain and simple. So the homies are asking me, like, well, are we going to tell the homies in advance? We're going to ask for a vote. I was like, I don't need a vote, bro. I know what's right, bro. He's, he's doing too much. He's victimizing a lot of people when he shouldn't have. This is my best friend, but he got to go. So we came out to yard, and I walked right up to him. And he was, uh, he was doing a... He was talking to a jailhouse lawyer because he was fighting an appeal that happened in Corcoran Shrew when they released his cell and got him victimized. So he had a lawsuit going on for millions. And we started jumping him right there in front of the committee. The committee didn't jump in because they didn't know what was going on. But there was three of us on one of him. And we took him down. He was a big boy. He used to lift weights, so he was real muscular. And we took him down. I kicked him in his face. I broke my toes. I cracked his nose. I think we fractured some of his ribs. The yard went down. Then we went back to the, we, we all went to the hole. And when he was in the hall, he was like, all right, bro, I got you guys. I'm after every single one of you guys. And I'm going to let Snoop know this. That's what threw me off. I was like, how you going to let Snoop know this when we're pretty much fulfilling orders from Snoop? This is Snoop's policies. You messed up. You were victimizing other people. You were being reckless with your program. So he threw me off with that one. But then while he was in the hole, he saw, I noticed that he was talking to two NCs and they were always communicating with him back and forth. 
So I actually reached out to him. I was like, hey, bro, from a childhood friend, bro, I want to stop you before you get yourself in the worst predicament. This this particular incident can be reinvestigated and reopened. And if you still want to be a rider, you can. You can come back. You can come back from this. Cause we can look at this like it was a physical discipline because you were acting out. I go, but once you start communicating with them, bro, you're going to be targeted. And that's it. And he chose his side and he became an NC. So I used to always tell my sons, like, man, it kind of sucks to be put in those kind of predicaments when you have to, you know, choose certain ideologies and friendships and movements over a personal friendship. Because remember, I took him into my house. He stayed out of my house. I did shootings with this individual. You know, he slept on my couch. You know, on the, I used to hang with this guy on the streets every day and function with him. So that meant something to me. So having to, so putting myself in that predicament where I had to decide friendship over, you know, laws and loyalty, when loyalty does reside with him as well, is a situation that kind of, if you think about it, intensifies the pain a lot more. Because I don't want to get rid of a good friend. I don't want to be putting hands on my friend just as much as I didn't like putting hands on my own, my own brothers in jail. But some things had to be done. So I, and I can sit here and illustrate some of the batteries that I've done on behalf of this movement that I can honestly regret that I felt like were unjustified. But like I said, when the majority rule and the majority vote is from individuals who think like Snoop, want to be Snoop, or want to worship Snoop so they can get the recognition that they deserve, is like, yeah, we're Snoop disciples and descendants. Those are hard, those are hard battles to fight. I've always been placed in ugly predicaments where I had to fight like that. So trust me when I tell you, there's a lot of batteries that I regret doing, and there's a lot of removals on the main line that I regret doing. But I will put them in the book. And I will talk about some of them on here to the best of my ability to answer your guys' questions. With that being said, I got three more videos I got to do in regards to certain questions, some good ones. And I also want to thank the subscribers that actually went on the baby registry and bought us some items, man. You guys have been a big help to us, to me and my son that's on this way. So I want to thank you guys, man. You guys mean a lot to me. I want to thank everybody for sharing my content. I appreciate it. And remember, one life, one chance, man. We only got one chance to do this right. Peace.